And thank you all for doing this, by the way. No one said thank you to you all yet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you are tuning in, um, you are in the right place for the park prescription webinar. I'm gonna give us a couple minutes to let other folks dial in. It's just about 1.30 now. So at about 1.32 or 1.33, we will, we will kick off the program. So we will sit here with awkward silence and try to look professional in the interim. Wish us luck. All right, well, we will jump right in. Um, thank you for joining us for this very special World Urban Park Epley Institute World Parks Academy uh, webinar, exploring something we've all heard a lot about, which is the parks as a prescription, but actually diving into it and going beyond the, the quick buzz lines and saying, how in the world do we do this? How does it get implemented? What does it really mean? And we have some medical experts with us today to help us think through that, which is an enormous step forward for us as park professionals. So thank all the speakers for joining us. We'll get into that shortly. As a quick intro, uh, you are joining a World Urban Parks uh, presentation and webinar. We do these about once a month and there are a number of them this park week, World Urban Park week. Um, so we encourage you to tune in. But if you'd like more about, to know about World Urban Park, uh, the website below will take you to it. Um, we are a small but rapidly growing organization. And I actually use the word organization uh, in our, inaccurately. I think the best term is we are a a uh, collaboration of provocateurs um, who tend to believe that stuff moves across the globe at light speed. I think COVID showed all of, all of us that very, very acutely. Um, but what we also have learned is that innovation spread across the world, uh, challenges are shared across the world. And we're a group, a collaboration of folks who wanna learn from one another, support one another, and then ultimately help the next generation of leaders who have to be smarter and better than us uh, work on the solutions for the world that is to come. Uh, the North American region has a variety of organizations involved in it. You can see these little green dots, uh, show you where those communities and those members are engaged. Uh, we encourage you to join and consider joining, consider tuning in with us as we do this journey together. Our next webinar that's up in the series will be in a couple of days, uh, brought to you by our colleagues at the Presidio and London and a few other places across the globe. Uh, diving into how we connect youth to nature through design. Uh, and this is kind of that natural play piece, but actually deeper than that. And it'll build on the talk today about really making that intergenerational connection between being outdoors, experiencing nature, experiencing physical fitness and activity as a way to help you live a better life. And then in May, um, part of the global piece is highlighting developments and innovations from around the globe. And we're really excited about this one uh, to learn about what are, what's going on in Latin America and our colleagues uh, from Mexico south to Terra de Fuego, um, all the different innovations and challenges that are going on in that rapidly growing part of the globe. Uh, their cities are growing like mad, uh, and they're confronting many of the challenges our uh, more developed and industrialized world did in the last hundred years. How do you build livable cities when they're facing a huge influx of residents? And we'll have three great speakers, probably one more from the United Nations that'll be joining us as well. Uh, walking through what's going on in this section of the world and how they're creating new public park spaces. Um, all of this is made possible by our sponsors, uh, one of which I just wanna highlight here on the screen, our partners at Marmac, uh, helping you track the productivity, the functionality, um, and how you work uh, with your park system to serve clients and families better than you can. So that's the general intro. Um, I will shut the heck up 
very, very shortly and turn it over to these speakers. Um, their bios go without saying, but these are folks on the front lines, both of the medical profession, but also in terms of park foundation and helping us work our way through uh, the idea of turning parks into the healthy resources that they are for the medical community, um, but even more importantly for the patients. And I believe first up, we were gonna turn it loose to Dr. Lem. Um, I will now stop sharing my screen and give command and control over and take it away. Um, couple, one more housekeeping thing, apologies. That's why I'm not a doctor. Um, we encourage you to get your questions to us on the chat feature or the Q&A. The Q&A will be answered during the talk, so fire any of your questions away there. And then we'll be putting links up into the chat if anything pops up during the talk where we can provide additional resources that you can look up at a later time. So with that, I am going to stop my sharing and turn it over to our speakers. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, Scott. Oh, I love that that photo <laughs> with your dog. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Lem. I'm going first, apparently. I'm Director of Parks Prescriptions for the BC Parks Foundation. And another hat that I wear is as um, President-elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So I think in all the work that I do and that we do around the nature and health space, we also bring that lens of planetary health. And it's something that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation, which I am going to share right now. And I want to mention that um, I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Indigenous Nations here in Canada in Vancouver, and are really grateful um, to these peoples for stewarding the beautiful lands that we enjoy and also protecting it right now um, for future generations. So um, I'm going to talk about park prescriptions within Canada and also a bit about the research behind why they're so good for us. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of us have this idea and we feel intuitively that when we go out into nature, we have a really, um, we feel calm, we feel energized, we feel more focused. And there's actually a lot of scientific, scientific evidence to back that up, which I'm going to start with reviewing. All right, so actually I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this first. So park prescriptions or nature prescriptions can be seen as sort of like a subset of social prescribing, which is a movement that is really starting to grow um, within Canada, within North America and countries around the world. And from a park prescription perspective, I think the reason why this can be especially effective in terms of a social prescription where healthcare professionals try to connect their patients or people to resources in their community that will improve their health by addressing um, different challenges they have as a result of living in society, the reason why I think it's so important to emphasize nature as part of that is because healthcare, for example, only makes up, as you can see in Canada, about 20 to 25 percent of our health status. So, as healthcare professionals, we think we we play such a huge part, you know, in the health of our patients. But that's not really the case. There's so many other different factors in people's lives that that contribute to their health status, um, including the amount of green spaces in their environments, including what they have access to in, in terms of community resources. So anyway, I'm going to go into some of the evidence behind why connecting people to nature is so good um, overall for their well-being and health. So these are just two um, infographics of the many ones that are out there that go into the, that talk about the, the research-based health benefits of nature. So from improved bone density to reduced risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease to improvements in depression and anxiety, reduced work stress and improved work satisfaction, reductions in ADHD symptoms in kids, um, reduced pain uh, during recovery from operative procedures while in hospitals. There's a huge body of evidence behind the health benefits of nature and it's only growing. And as someone trained in biology and as, as a physician, I always think, okay, like what are the mechanisms behind this? Like why, why do we love nature so much? Why do, our, why do our brains crave nature so much? And there are two theories in terms of why nature is so good for our brains. And the first one is called attention restoration theory. And what it essentially what the problem is, is that our brains haven't evolved to feel comfortable in urban environments yet. So when you spend time in a city, there are lots of lights, it's busy, there's traffic, there are lots of different obstacles that you have to constantly direct your attention towards to move around and navigate around. And this tires at our brains, it makes us tired, it makes us stressed and irritable. Whereas when you spend time in nature, it's sort of like a source of soft fascination. So it's, it's interesting, but you don't have to constantly direct your attention. And so what that does is it, it replenishes your powers of attention and reduces your fatigue and reduces your irritability and promotes this overall sense of, of well-being in your brain and your body. And the second theory is called stress reduction theory. And it kind of, it kind of speaks to how we evolved in nature. So if you think about it, 
spending time in nature or natural environments have everything that we need as humans to survive. So it has food sources, it has water sources, um, things that you can use to make shelter, heights that you can go up to to look out for predators and also look out to the next place that your, um, your family or your community was going to migrate to. And when you think about it, nat again, nature has all those things. So brains that sort of grew to uh, to appreciate those environments and were less stressed and wanted to stay in those environments, then kind of passed on those nature loving genes, those nature loving brains to future um, generations who also have that kind of intrinsic craving for nature and the stress reducing benefits of it. Now I'm just going to talk about a couple of my favorite studies um, that have to do with the health benefits of nature. And the first one is a study that's based in Toronto. And what it did was it combined high resolution satellite imagery, individual tree data and Ontario health study data and self reports of health perception. And after controlling for a number of confounders, they found that 10 more trees per block affected pe people's health perception, similar to an increase in their personal income of $10,000 per year, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year higher median income and being seven years younger. So as a health professional, I know that both income and age are major determinants of health. And so I thought it was really neat how the study kind of compared and brought, down, brought it down to the level of trees in your environment and these things that we know are really closely linked to health. And this study um, I like because it sort of speaks to nature as medication in a direct way. So this was a small pilot study um, done out of Chicago. And what they did was they guided 17 kids with ADHD on three different 20 minute walks through a city park, through a downtown area and through a residential area. And what they found was that the 20 minute walk in the park actually improved what's called their digit span backwards performance. So essentially what you do is you recite a bunch of numbers in a row and then you get the child or the person you're testing to recite them back to you. And, and the higher the, the number that they can recite back to you correctly, um, the better their attention and memory. And so what they found was that the park walk in particular actually improved their DSP performance to levels similar to kids without ADHD. So if you look at this graph, you can see, I don't know if you can see my little cursor there, but that the leftmost um, park line actually is significantly better in terms of their DSB score than the neighborhood or downtown walks. So again, there's something about nature, perhaps that kind of brain boosting effect that helps kids concentrate better. And in fact, um, the study authors compared it to uh, found that the magnitude of benefit was actually it rivaled the peak effects of Ritalin or prescription stimulant medication. So no one is saying that a walk in the park is going to replace prescription medication, but I think it really demonstrates that it can be outdoor time can be a really powerful adjunct um, when it comes to brain health and concentration, especially in kids. All right, and something else I wonder as a physician um, is how much nature do we need? Like what, what is the dose you know, that we're looking at when we're prescribing something? And in the last couple of years, some of that evidence has started to come out. So this is a study of almost 20,000 adults in England. And um, what they found was that their likelihood of reporting good health or high well-being was significantly greater when their nature contact reached greater than or equal to about two hours per week. And what they found is that these benefits continued to accrue, but that these positive associations peaked around 200 to 300 minutes per week. So, you know, up to this amount, the kind of the more, the better. And so in our park prescriptions program here in Canada, we do have a set recommendation to make it easy for prescribers that patients spend at least two hours in nature cumulatively each week. And then I guess another question is how much nature do you need each time? And there's actually a lot of research behind that. And, and there are some studies showing that even just five minutes spent in nature can improve, um, can improve kind of some mental health markers. But this was a, a, a study that I thought was really cool that came out about two years ago, again in 2019, um, that brought it down to a biological level. So um, what they did was over eight weeks, they asked 36 urban dwellers to have a nature experience in an outdoor place that brought them a sense of contact with nature. So it could really be anywhere as long as they felt like they had a meaningful nature experience. They asked them to do this at least three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And what they found was that their cortisol or stress hormone levels dropped about 20% more after a nature experience compared to a non-nature experience. And the efficiency of that nature pill was greatest between 20 and 30 minutes. So if you look at this graph again on the right-hand side, that kind of second or third, I guess, um, interrupted red line, you can see that the, the efficiency of the, that cortisol drop is highest um, between that 20 and 30 minute mark. So a lot of us are really busy. Uh, many of us live in, in environments where, or kind of lifestyles where it's hard to fit things into our lives. And so if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, 
you can aim for that 20 to 30 minute sweet spot in terms of your cortisol drop. Um, so we do recommend trying to aim for at least 20 minutes each time in that overall two hour per week um, time frame. And from that planetary health perspective, um, one, one might ask of why is the BC Parks Foundation, for example, why are they focusing on health? Like why, why are they trying to push this message across? And we can take some of these, these, these lessons from climate change research. And this was a study um, where they questioned over 300 American parents about their greatest concerns regarding global environmental issues. And what they found was that three different types of environmental concern arose. So one form was biospheric concern or concern for nature. Um, social altruistic concern or concern for other people and egoistic concern or concern for themselves, um, like their own lifestyle. And what they found was that the social altruistic and egoistic people didn't really care about images around polar bears and coral reefs. What they found was that the messaging that they tested on them really resonated was when, when they focused on personal and family health impacts. So if we want to motivate people to get out into nature, um, something really effective if you extrapolate these ideas is focusing on their health, on the personal and family health benefits um, of spending time in nature. So again, I think that's a reason why nature prescriptions could be such an effective way at getting people to, mo to motivate them to get outside by underlying those personal health benefits. And then finally, why connecting nature is good for the planet. So um, healthcare is a major contributor to global carbon dioxide emissions. And if global healthcare were a country, it would actually be the fifth highest carbon emitter in the world. And so anything that improves the health status of our patients is going to reduce um, their use of resources and reduce our overall carbon emissions. Also increasing nature in our, in our cities makes us healthier. So from reducing the urban heat island effect as climate change warms the planet to the personal um, health benefits of spending time in nature, just filling, filling our cities with nature is good from both kind of a climate perspective and from a human health perspective. Also kids who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists and adults who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it. So there is some research around this showing that people who are more nature connected are more, nat are more likely to kind of grow up and, and behave in more pro-environmental ways. And so this doesn't just extend, you know, to want to spending time, to be wanting to spend time in nature or conservation. People who um, are more connected to nature also tend to conserve energy more. They also tend to talk to their politicians more about climate change and the action that we need to take on it. So um, what we're thinking is that by kind of connecting more people to nature in our in our in our communities, this will kind of create a body of people who, who are just who will push to make our planet healthier in general. And finally, uh, the executive director of the UN Environment Program has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So it's estimated that if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change globally, that this could get us over one third of the way towards our Paris Agreement carbon reduction targets. Right now, only about 3% of climate investments worldwide are into these nature-based solutions for climate change, which focus on protecting and restoring and sustainably managing and expanding our, our, our natural spaces. So there's this huge gap between the potential for improvement in carbon emissions and the amount that's being invested. So again, nature prescriptions, connecting people to nature, I think is a powerful way to, to close that gap between potential and reality right now. So I'm just going to quickly share some of the resources that we have. So our Canadian URL uh, website is parkprescriptions.ca, and that's our, our lovely homepage. And we tried to make it really um, kind of concise and simple with re really kind of simple and engaging messaging so people don't feel overwhelmed when they head to our website with information. So really everything in there is, is kind of hyperlinked to, to research um, and, uh, and references and also just really gives kind of the top quick tips for both patients and prescribers on, on how to maximize their nature prescriptions. And then these are just a couple of the resources that we have. So when people click on prescribers, click on get started, we'll send them a package that includes information about how to prescribe effectively and also um, a personalized nature prescription file with their code that they can use to start prescribing um, after they upload it into their electronic medical records and then log their prescription codes on our website. And we're working on other initiatives as well to incentivize and uh, track nature time in our patients. And something that I'm really proud of um, 
is our, kind of our, our fact sheets that have to do with, with um, the health benefits of nature. We have 14 different fact sheets broken down by health issue for adults and kids to kind of remind prescribers about the health conditions that nature is good for, and also a really easy and time effective way um, for busy prescribers who don't always have that much time to counsel to, to give their patient the top tips and, and some motivation. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. I think I'm going to jump right in here and continue on. So uh, Melissa and I work really closely through the BC Parks Foundation, which the Parks Program is an initiative of. And I'm also in Vancouver in the, the same um, traditional territory. And I want to talk a little bit about the the beginnings of this program. And to start with that story, I'm going to talk about the Healthy by Nature initiative through the BC Parks Foundation. So the, um, the foundation here was launched in the beginning of 2018 and recognized a huge gap here in BC and across Canada between health and nature. We really weren't seeing any programs that were focused on this and we were inspired by many of the programs that we saw in the US, which we're gonna hear about um, briefly here too. So uh, we launched the Healthy by Nature initiative and really, whoops, there we go. Oh, darn, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've messed up two of my slides, but that's okay, we'll come back to this. Um, I, I'm going to tell you more about the Healthy by Nature initiative in a minute, but maybe I will jump to this since I've mixed up my slides and hopefully uh, kick off with a bit of a feeling. So when we offer these workshops regularly, Melissa and I ask participants to think about one word that describes how you feel when you're outside in nature. So I know that we're not going to create these word clouds today, but I just want you to think for a minute about what your word would be. And then I'm going to share in those next slides, these are two of the word clouds that we've had in the last little while with um, physicians across the country here in Canada. So you can see that those same words keep coming up. It's always that peaceful, calm, connected, energized. And although, um, you know, there's all this amazing evidence behind it, this to me just shows that at our core, we know we know that it is healthy for us to be outside. And so we really want to, sh to share that feeling obviously with, um, with our participants. So th this is the slide that I was hoping for next after Healthy by Nature. Our goal was to get more people outside more often to enjoy nature and benefit from green time. And this was for the health of people and for the health of our parks. And there's such an interesting link there that shows that when people get outside more, they're caring more about parks, they're protecting parks more, and those parks are healthier. And as those parks become healthier, more people come out to enjoy them. So it's a really, um, a really neat connection there. And just when we launched the Healthy by Nature initiative, the Canada's chief public health officer also announced that access to active play in nature and outdoors is essential for healthy child development. So that was really, uh, really important um, for us. So our goal really with the program was to build a lifestyle and a community outside and unplugged. And so the idea is to create a new social norm in the same way that we all put our seatbelts on when we get in our car and we all brush our teeth before bed. We want people to get outside and have nature time every single day as a part of their day. It's not, it's a non-negotiable. It's not something you have to, to think about. So the Parks Prescriptions Program um, is a key component of the Health, Healthy by Nature initiative. So the idea is, is that uh, patients can take those Parks Prescriptions and then come in and find fabulous things to do in nature through the Healthy by Nature program and get involved in that community. So the Parks Prescriptions program that we've, uh, we have here was launched nationwide to help diverse communities and individuals get those health benefits, the mental and physical health benefits of getting outside in nature. And then at the same time, creating this uh, environmental stewardship piece that is a really fabulous offshoot of getting people outside and protecting their own health. And as Melissa mentioned in her presentation, I mean, she and I, I think, are great examples of 
um, people who had those amazing childhood connections to nature and those experiences that have then inspired us to this environmental stewardship in our careers. So we were inspired by all of the fabulous programs that we've, we see across the US. These are just a few of the logos. Um, we spoke to a lot of people, learned about all of these amazing things that were happening. Um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with some of the, these things. This is the, the 2018 report, but I include this just because it's really fascinating for me to see the growth and how quickly the Parks RX movement grew across the US. And we're really excited to, to be launching that across Canada too. And the other piece is that, uh, again, they've got a, a lovely word cloud, my favorite. And it's just to, to show that it's this isn't just uh, physicians who are prescribing time in nature. It's a lot broader than that. And so we are, uh, we're aiming to work with lots of these different groups to make sure that we have as many nature prescriptions uh, out there as possible. So I include this, uh, this one again, this is um, an American conference that it happens every year. And I really like this visual because it shows that daily, weekly, monthly, uh, you know, your annual goals. And I, what we come across all the time it, it are people who say, well, I don't have time to uh, go get nature time. I don't have time to go do a backpacking trip for a week. And really it's not about that. It's about getting outside in your garden or at your local park or whatever that looks like. It's those daily little doses and those little pieces. And then of course you can build up as it, as it comes. But um, the other reason I include this is that uh, one of the most fascinating conversations I had with, uh, as we were building this program was with one of the CEOs of the Blue Cross Foundation who said that she was at this conference one year and she met a really interesting man next to her and, and so looked him up on LinkedIn later that night, couldn't find him, Facebook, Instagram, went through the whole social social media thing, couldn't find him. So the next day um, at the seminar or whatever it was, she said, you know, I couldn't find you online, but I'd love to connect uh, after the conference. And he said, well, I'm not online. I'm with Homeland Security and we're concerned that the next generation of children don't have um, the physical and mental uh, connection to nature that they're going to need um, to serve in the military. So I, that was incredibly interesting to me. And it just showed the, uh, how broad the concern is, I guess, for, for this lack of connection. So uh, the Parks Prescriptions Program has started out with physicians as the primary audience for this initial rollout uh, because they're in such a unique position. They're a trusted healthcare provider. They've got a little bit of time to counsel and educate and they can, they can promote behaviors by writing these prescriptions. So we ran uh, focus groups and surveys and we found that these were the, the key barriers here in BC for um, writing parks prescriptions. So billing was a big one. The evidence, which has been um, you know, Melissa shared the huge body of evidence behind this, which is great. And so getting that information out there, sharing that with physicians was really, really important. Um, EMR inclusion, which is is a totally other story, um, the time that it takes to counsel these uh, patients as well. So working on, on how do we find out where they're at and then get to the next step really quickly, following up and then making it relevant, um, which is where the Healthy by Nature program comes in. So this is an example of what a, a parks prescription looks like here in Canada. And it's really an opportunity for the patient and the physician to work together to create a plan and put it down in writing, which uh, has been shown to have much more of an impact on behavior change. These are a couple of the uh, posters that we've got for waiting rooms and physician lunchrooms, just the idea of that, that nature pill, which is really great. So uh, for us, the key piece of the Parks Prescriptions Program was having that evidence base, which Melissa shared on the website, and I encourage you to check that out if you have the time. So lots of fact sheets and just lots of evidence to support this. So I'm going to, I'm going to end it there because I know we have lots of more to cover, but if you have any questions, please pop them to the chat. Thank you so much.
So Dr. Zar, the platform is yours. Oh, fantastic. Uh, um, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, thanks for two wonderful presentations um, by Dr. Lem and Jenny. Um, and I just wanted to apologize beforehand that I um, have a, a, a visit that I have to make my own health. Uh, my own health is at uh, <laughs> not, the, not the best of shape these days. So I'm gonna um, stay within my 10 minutes. And then um, if you have any questions, which I can't really stay for, for the Q and A, um, please don't hesitate to reach me. Um, and the best place to find me is actually just on our website. So if you go to www.park rxamerica.org, um, you'll find uh, a lot of information about um, what I do uh, in terms of my work um, with uh, my nonprofit, and um, there'll be a contact way to reach me on there as well. Um, so I just, you know, we're, guys, we're, we're traveling quite a distance from BC to DC. So I'm in based in Washington, DC. I'm a, a pediatrician by, by uh, training. Um, I still practice five days a week. Believe it or not, I'm not sure how I continue to do that, but I still love seeing my patients and families. Um, I know uh, Melissa mentioned, uh, you know, the uh, wealth of uh, science uh, that really outlines uh, the connection between nature and improved human health outcomes. I do invite you um, to visit our website once again at parkrxamerica.org. I'm stressing America because if you go to ParkRx, you won't find us. Um, and there'll be a big banner on top that says free um, continuing education activity. It is free to take. Um, and uh, it, there's a lot of good science on there. And uh, really everything um, we've encapsulated that we could encapsulate within one hour. Um, so just a big plug for that if you wanted to take a look at it. Um, I love the fact that we're using the language of parks and nature and it seems to go sort of interchangeably. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, when I first started doing this work, uh, you know, back in, uh, when was it, 2010, 11, um, you know, Park RX uh, was really something that um, uh, was new to me, and it's a term that's really stuck, and obviously it's in our name as our, as our national nonprofit is, um, Park RX America, but I, I'm these days really tending to shift more towards just nature. And I love the pyramid that you put up, Jenny, because it really stresses the importance of nearby accessible. Um, not to say that that one year trip to Banff or that one in a lifetime trip to Yellowstone isn't important, it is. But really when we talk about our clients and those daily interactions, um, it's about the daily experience. And I think park still resonates quite a bit. Um, the, other, the other piece of this, these nature prescriptions or park prescriptions that I'm particularly interested in is, is a little bit of the structure, the RX. Um, so why the RX? And, um, and I'm guessing from our audience, probably not a lot of uh, participants you know, provide, you know, in the health professions area. So RX you know, is the symbol we use for a prescription. And it's a symbol that is well recognized by patients, clients, doctors, other health professionals, it's globally recognized. Um, there's almost nobody who doesn't really understand some, something conceptual about the prescription. So the RX is a great symbol. I also like the RX because it gives structure and I've based my work and my prescription that we have on our platform um, very much on a medical prescription. So just like you wouldn't say to somebody, hey, um, take this antibiotic as often as you want, um, as many times a day, and I'll see you back whenever. No, it's quite specific and it has that level of specificity because that's what we need to do as doctors and to get as patients in order to get better. Um, and I feel very much the same way about a nature prescription. Um, and if you visit our website, you'll see a one minute tutorial on how to prescribe. So I'm not gonna do that for you. Um, and you'll see a bunch of resources on what this script actually looks like. It looks like a medical script. It has four ingredients to it, which gives it its architecture. The first is a place. So we got to identify a place, like where do you plan on being, which is na somewhat nature rich. It could be you know, a window looking out of your room if you're so afraid of, of uh, either, either police brutality or you're so afraid of COVID, um, which is often the case in the United States. Unfortunately, maybe that's a view of nature is all you have. And that's okay, because we try to go where the patient is and really build this around the patient or client. Um, the next thing is an activity. What are you planning on doing outside? Um, you could sit outside, you could move outside. Um, as physicians, as health professionals, 
we're really encouraging, you know, human powered transportation to that place as often as possible. But once again, within flexibility, some people don't have safe, comfortable uh, access to that kind of place. So they might have to drive, they might have to take public transport. Um, the third is a frequency. How, how often do you plan on doing this? Um, I saw patients just this morning and went through a nature prescription this morning. And I always ask my, my clients, um, whether they're you know six years old or 16, um, or the parents, where do you feel safe and comfortable? Where is that place? And I work within that context. I don't try to you know, find this magical place that I think is perfect for them. Um, I try to really get from them, understand from them, what is it that's gonna work for them, which still sort of gives me some room to massage a bit, so to speak, that prescription to make it a little bit more therapeutic for them. Um, sometimes I really try to get to hone down on that schedule in terms of which days a week, is it an afternoon, is it a morning? A lot of our kids are still um, uh, doing online school. So they've got this you know, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. window and that's very common right now. Um, the weekends are more flexible. So I try to get them to commit to an actual you know, day and time. Um, and then the fourth is how long do you plan on being out there? Um, as silly as this may sound, once again, how long do you plan on being out there is the kind of question that gets our clients to be able to commit to um, this fourth piece, half an hour, one and a half hours, what is it you plan on doing? And that gives us the structure with immense flexibility, both for the healthcare professional and for the family. So they can really work within those realms. So I really, my, what I promote, what I teach other physicians and other health professionals to do is to work within the, the architecture of this prescription, but to be able to counsel, to ask the right questions and to not think of this as an, an addition to, right? I'm not, I, I love those barriers you outlined, Jenny, because you know, it's, I don't have time, they say, I don't have time to do this. And I say to my colleagues, well, you have time because you're already doing it. You do it, you counsel your patients on obesity, you counsel them on physical inactivity, you counsel them on diabetes and on and on on diet, et cetera. But what I ask them to do is try doing the counseling this way. So if you're gonna spend any of your breath uh, talking about um, diet, or if you're gonna spend your breath talking about time outside, about moving, about diabetes, education, et cetera, try to incorporate this prescription into your conversation. It's pretty easy to do. As I said earlier, it takes about a minute and nine seconds. Uh, my 12 year old uh, created this video of me explaining how to do it. So please watch that on our website. Um, so that is uh, part of what I wanted to get across is the structure. And uh, um, we have now, just so you have a better understanding of, of where we are, um, at Park RX America. Um, we uh, founded ourselves as a nonprofit back in April of 2017. Um, and we went uh, with, you know, we created this, took us some time to get this platform up and running electronically, which it is now, of course. And that was back in January of 2019. And since then, uh, we had a, you know, early in 2019, and I presented at that, uh, that shift conference uh, that, uh, um, Jenny was alluding to earlier, um, when I presented uh, and won the Jurors Award, um, we had 25 registrants uh, back then. Uh, we now have over 1,100 uh, registrants. They're mostly physicians, mostly MDs, but we've got this full spectrum now, um, pretty much every specialty. Uh, we've got physical therapists, we have occupational therapists, psychiatrists, mental health, behavioral health. We have some educators who've come on board as well. So we're really very encouraging of uh, anybody who's in that professional role, um, who's doing the counseling to be able to write that script and really let the patient drive it, let the client drive it. Um, that's one of my, my main take home messages I think is so important. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Lem mentioned research. I just wanted to briefly mention that I'm the co-principal investigator on a randomized controlled trial uh, on nature park prescriptions. Um, we're about a year and a half into it. We've got another three and a half years. Um, we're trying to recruit about 500 uh, participants and we're looking at a bunch of different outcomes ranging from accelerometry, so how much are you moving, how intensely, intensively are you moving, to physical biomarkers in the EMR, which we can mine, plus the survey research, plus some mental health and cognitive measures. So we're very excited at some point to be able to share that with the group. Um, I have probably one minute left. 
Uh, so I'm gonna forfeit that minute uh, to a Q&A. If there is a question, I could probably take one question. Otherwise, I do apologize again uh, for having to leave a little bit early. Um, and uh, my contact information you'll find um, on our website, www.parkrxamerica.org. Thank you so much to everybody. That's great, Dr. Zara, take advantage of your time. There's one question brilliantly positioned for you. How are you able to address key barriers faced by physicians on giving nature prescriptions? specifically on the limited consultation time. Yeah, so um, once again, you know, uh, you can work through any barrier and a lot of the barriers are what I would call perceived barriers um, because the, at the end of the day, um, we have 15, maybe 20 minutes if you're lucky per, per, per client, per visit. And uh, as I said earlier, um, the best thing to talk about with physicians is this is not in addition to the work you already do. Uh, it's very important to tell them you're already counseling. What I'm suggesting is that you counsel your patients in a different, a slightly different way. Tweak the wonderful work you do. Tweak that motivational interviewing that you wonderfully do. Tweak that, you know, use, pivot that relationship that Jenny mentioned, that trusting relationship that you have with your patient and ask them, where do you feel safe and comfortable? What do you do out there? How often do you wish to be out there and for how long? And you could tell that took about five seconds of my time and let the client tell you and write it down as they tell you and print that prescription, copy and paste it, put it in the chart, put it in the electronic chart, see them back in a month or two or three, either telemed or on site and follow up with them like you do anything else in your work, whether it's diabetes, obesity, hypertension, asthma, depression, or anxiety. Okay, I'm gonna steal you for two more minutes because I know you got PT. I had my PT this morning, so I'm I'm free and clear for the rest of the day. Um, Sorry. Question to you. Okay, so park people, you know, we when we're doing our chicken dinner lunch speaking, and we're out, we're speechifying everyone about the benefit of park. Give us a couple just bullet points if we have medical professionals in the room. What should we be saying? Listen, the, the bottom line is our medical visits are terribly negative, okay? We have these things called problem lists, okay? We think about you all as clients as problems, and we try to address these problems one by one. Think about how positive this moment is for you in the office to ask your patient where they feel safe and comfortable, what they like to do outside, where they like to go, to, where they like to go and what they like to do, and turn that into something positive. Work within the context of your client, work within their social determinants, work within their environment, work within their access and their ideas of what they can do, and then amplify that a bit if you have to as a, as a health professional to make it as therapeutic as you can make it. But designing this, designing the prescription based on your client and making it unique is really the key for success. Great. Well, if you've got to run, you've got to run. So we won't be um, annoyed or take it wrong. But thank you for spending time today. Listen to the questions and to the answers and the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this crowd. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Dr. Lem or, or Jenny, I'll throw this one to y'all. Um, we haven't talked about mental health. And there's a question that came in about addressing mental health. Um, instead of, you know, the standard here, take this blue pill and everything will get better any insights or information you can share on that? Not that you're in Vancouver, Canada that may have some sunshine issues there. Yeah, do you know, I think a lot of people and what the media kind of tries to present park prescriptions are as an alternative to medication. And that's definitely not what we're about. Like we, we view it as an adjunct to medication if it's needed. Like there's no way I'm going to have a patient coming into my office who's asking me for medication and who's in a really bad way. And I say, oh no, just take this nature prescription flippantly. Like it, that's definitely not what we do. So I think the two definitely fit together. They complement. I mean, and what Dr. Zar was saying about, about adding nature as a recommendation um, when you're doing counseling, I think, I think that's what it is. So essentially along with healthy diet, along with adequate exercise, along with good sleep, spending time in nature is just is like the fourth essential pillar of health. And so, yeah, it's, it's not either or, it's, it's both and essentially it's, it's um, yeah, that's definitely not what we're trying to do is replace medication. I mean, yeah. on a general population level, if more people did spend more time in nature outdoors, whether or not that really, you know, that led to more um, physical activity that would overall increase population health, but on an individual level, when a patient comes into my office, I'm not trying to push nature on them instead of medication. Yeah. 
Can I, can I quickly jump in on that too? Um, obviously not coming from a physician perspective, but I think that this also speaks to the preventative health side and that if you're incorporating this into your prescriptions with every patient who walks through the door, then potentially you'll have the opportunity to prevent some of those bigger problems down the road. Again, not to, um, not to replace nature with medication, but I think that that preventative piece is really important with nature. All right, all right, Jenny, I wanna hijack it just a little bit. You had a slide up there in your deck that was absolutely stunning. Um, the, uh, almost like the, the old food pyramid. Could I impose upon you to bring that slide back up and maybe spend a couple minutes diving into it? Because there was a question here about access to nature in terms of transportation, how you get to yes. it. And I think you um, speak to that beautifully in that, that infographic. So this one here, and I wish yes, I could yes, take yes. Um, credit for it. It's it, So this is what Dr. Zara was speaking to as well from this. Um, so this Shift RX Challenge, there's a conference every year. Um, I want to say in Colorado, but I really don't know. Now I've completely forgotten. But anyway, um, I, I agree. I love this as well because it speaks to that question that, um, that it's just small steps. When I work with um, teachers here in BC, we talk about 100 meter field trips. And I think the same could apply to this as well. We are not suggesting that you go to the mountains and go on a backpacking trip, whatever, you know, I think Melissa might've touched on this, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about what nature, uh, what qualifies as nature. And I think the really interesting piece behind a lot of this research is that uh, nature is whatever you perceive it to be. So I love gardening and I feel connected to nature when I'm in my front yard gardening. And so I think that counts. And I think I get the, the mental health benefits from that. I also ha live across the street. I'm very lucky to live across the street from a city park with some beautiful trees. And again, for me and for my kids, that counts as nature. So I think that we gain the benefits. Melissa, I don't know if you want to jump in on that too. Yeah, absolutely. And just in terms of the spectrum of what, what kind of improves our health when we're connected to nature, there's research showing that just photos on your wall or house plants, you know, or just looking out your window at nature can improve health outcomes. So I totally agree is that um, I feel like traditionally with park prescriptions, there has been a lot of focus on, on parks, but I, yeah, I think, I think we should shift it maybe to more like a nature prescription, you know, like not necessarily parks. I know that a lot of these initiatives kind of come from parks organizations, but, um, but I think it's really more like a nature prescription, not necessarily a park prescription. And wherever you can feel it, however you can feel it in small and larger ways is, is, what, is, is what we're looking for. The sidebar to that, I don't know if you all have connected with um, the National Park Cities Movement, um, but worth an exploration as they're trying to recontextualize cities as the whole city is a park not just these little green boxes. And, and then how that integrates with health, just some interesting cross poll pollination, because I'm sitting out here in Kentucky about ready to sneeze at any moment because of pollen. <laughs> uh, but pollination as it would be there. Um, question to you with the global audience here, you know, healthcare is delivered a thousand different ways in a thousand different countries and the systems by which it's delivered are differently. Any thoughts to folks in countries that may not have the same Canadian, American or European system of medical care and, and how to engage uh, the medical communities in those nations in terms of deploying this technique? That is a great question. I can't say I'm super familiar with different health, you know, the ways people in different countries practice outside of kind of this European North American model. Um, but I think this principle is universal. Like I think I think everyone in, to a certain extent, most humans understand that being outdoors and being in nature makes them feel good. So whether you're a Western trained physician or whether you're a psychologist or, or like a, you know, a counselor, what, whatever way that may manifest in different countries, I think it's universal. Like, I think, I mean, perhaps this idea of, a, I think most um, physicians across the world prescribe things, I'm pretty sure. I think that's probably something that's quite universal is like writing something on a piece of paper, taking it to your pharmacy and, and filling it. So I think that idea of a prescription for nature or parks probably would be something that's relevant in many in many contexts. Um, but if you're not a physician, like if you're if you're someone who doesn't traditionally prescribe, with Parker X America and with our platform, it's open to any licensed healthcare professional and really 
the reason we're putting it in their hands is because these are the kinds of people who talk to people about their health every day. And they're the people who are trusted um, by patients, by their communities when, when recommending things that are good for their health. So I think, yeah, any, any licensed healthcare professional within Canada, um, any person, any professional um, who's interested in health anywhere in the world, I think, I feel like this concept would be relevant to them. Jenny, anything you wanna to add to that? Well, I, I like what, um, you know, Carl in the chat has just shared one of the studies in the UK because we have seen Parks prescriptions in some other countries across the world. And we've also seen programs driven by the, the Parks field called Healthy People, Healthy Parks. And it might not be driven by physicians, but it's driven by these, these Parks programs. And I think that maybe one of the, one of the things that COVID has shown us in this past year is how important it is to all of us to get outside. And I know we've seen that in Canada and the US and in many places, I imagine almost everywhere in the world, people really realize how important it is to get outside. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that that will continue, right? And we'll, we'll continue to see people wanting to get outside and have an appetite for these types of programs and these initiatives. Let me flip the script on you. We're parkies. Um, what barriers do we unwittingly or unknowingly put in the way of people getting these benefits? If you were gonna reverse engineer our work, give us some guidance. What can we do better? Or, or what are we doing worse to create barriers that don't need to be there if you could flip a magic switch? Well, that's a good I, question. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> I mean, there are so many different barriers, I guess, to nature access when it comes to parks like user fees, you know, like admission fees, all that kind of stuff. And that's something that we are working with, like with different parks organizations and outdoor event organizations to reduce those barriers. But of course that's where a lot of revenue comes from. So, you know, we're not, from the health side, we're not gonna begrudge you your user fees or park admission fees. Um, I think, I th and I think, it, you know, this is improving in recent years, but I feel like the outdoors, for a long time has kind of been like the images that we imagine that we see that have traditionally been marketed to us as people outdoors is kind of like non-racialized people, fairly wealthy looking people with all the hiking gear, you know, the fancy shoes or whatever. And that's kind of a barrier because I feel like a lot of um, racialized populations, like they haven't seen themselves traditionally in those images. And so that's something else, as Jenny knows that we're working with the BC Parks Foundation on uh, is connecting those more marginalized, co connecting those new Canadians um, to nature and trying to help them see that there is a place for them in it. So I think both from the marketing side and then I guess from the, whatever, from the user fee side, which can't really be changed that much. Um, I think that's something that, that could be improved, but I think there is headway being made on that. I completely agree. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna add one thing if that's okay, Scott, to that. I think the other group that we see a barrier with is youth. And we see lots of youth who are on their devices and they are, you know, more, more connected to technology than they are to uh, real life or, or the outdoors. And one of the initiatives that we were working on was using technology to actually help get people outside. And there are a lot of people that say, well, technology has no place in nature. You know, we get these purists, which is fine. And that's great. But I think that if it's a stepping stone to get you there, then fabulous. And so um, with the Parks Foundation, we, we worked with um, an Indigenous community in the interior of BC, and we had uh, these kids, they were 14 to 16, um, from an Indigenous community, and they, using their own language, described some of the Native species along a trail. So we recorded the audio, and then we installed just QR codes along this trail, everyone on, a, on posts. So all of a sudden, you know, you can do this walk and they're very innocuous, tiny little posts with a little QR code, but you scan it with your phone and all of a sudden you can hear these indigenous youth talking about the native plants along the trail. And the incredible reaction that we've seen from that community and the empowerment of the youth who are now like, wow, this is my place, this is my trail. And it's something in kind of neat with the technology to do out there. And I, there's so many opportunities. I mean, the AI options to, to link up with the QR codes and, and you know, we filmed some 360 view stuff so that we, elders could actually participate from their home if they weren't able to access it. Anyway, I think that there's, there's a really neat opportunity there to use some cool technology to, to link youth and, and maybe others too who might be nervous about the outdoors. 
Okay. I want to pick that up at a little different angle. What about our aging population? You know, we, we're not getting younger. Uh, we're getting older faster. What can we do better to keep people of an advanced age outdoors and in the parks? What, what, and what impact have you seen any? Now I'm going to ask you a research question. Have you seen the same benefits uh, for our seniors uh, and our elders in terms of time outdoors as they age as well? Yeah, I guess I'll pick up. I'll, I know, Jenny, I'm sure you'll have things you want to say about that. So I think just keeping accessibility in mind, you know, like when when we are designing parks and open spaces, just again, thinking about those people who can't hike up a mountain. Um, we have to have ramps. We have to have ways for people in wheelchairs or with mobility devices to access them. And then I think there is research, definitely a huge body of research around elders and the health benefits of nature. But one thing I want to underline is that people often think a prescription for nature is a prescription for physical activity in nature. And while that's great, and while that has all kinds of health benefits, just sitting in nature has a lot of benefits. I mean, there there's research around healing gardens, for example, and elders with cognitive issues or dementia. And when they take them out into the healing garden during the daytime, they sleep better at night and they have less confusion. Um, so I think emphasizing to elders, you don't have to be walking. Like you can sit on the park bench for half an hour or an hour and look at the trees and breathe the air and you can still get those benefits. So I think, I think not making nature prescriptions such a like rah, rah, outdoor, let's hike up the mountain thing. And just again, focusing on that connection to nature is important. Again, for making it feel like to elders, like it's something that they can participate in. Well, I'll just, I, sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to add that on our last, uh, we did a workshop a couple of weeks ago that, and there was an architect in the audience and she was saying that she is really hoping to see a shift in some of the, the rules around how we're building um, care homes and incorporating nature and making that a requirement, not just a nice to have, but a key piece that allows them to have that connection to nature, as Melissa said, I mean, even a view of nature or even accessing it via technology has benefits. I mean, Melissa shared with me some research where patients in the hospital, if they can see green out their window, they get released earlier. They have better health outcomes after they've been released. They have less pain. It's, it's incredible. This has been just awesome. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. I, I feel like I've been asking all the questions. So I wanna give a second to see if anything else trips in here. Um, so I don't steal everything. Uh, here's one that came in. It, how did the lockdown due to COVID-19 impact the implementation of nature prescription? And this is especially people's adherence to it. I don't know if that's getting to social distancing or safe distancing or how that one, but did you see an impact from COVID or then we all just kind of went, hey, you've taken away everything. You took away our museums, our bars, our restaurants, our libraries, our theaters, our, our art galleries, the only thing we have left is the park. Um, did you see any mm -hmm. playback from that? Do you know, it was kind of unfortunate, but I, again, I understand why this happened earlier on in the pandemic, like all the national parks shut down, like they closed, all our provincial parks shut down. And so people were looking for a safe way to de-stress and, and experience recreation and they couldn't. Like it was, it was awful actually, like for, for a number of reasons, like the first part of the pandemic was awful for a number of reasons, but that was a major reason why it felt particularly awful is because this outlet that we normally had, we couldn't access in the same way anymore. So I think if anything, like, I don't know if, what, you know, what people have been reading in the media, but there are a lot of stories out there about how important nature has been for people's well-being during the pandemic. Like we've seen, I don't, I don't know, a hundred percent increases in park use last summer or whatever. So I think it's really, emphasizing to people how important nature is. And by extension, um, I don't know the exact stat, Jenny, you might know, but the B, like our BC government here, our provincial government has announced a multi-million dollar investment into improving our parks, which is amazing. Like during a pandemic when we're, like we're hemorrhaging money, essentially, it's like they are, they're, they're actually, um, they've identified that parks are important to people and actually starting to invest in them. And that's a lot of the messaging that we tried to put forward, like both, both with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and the BC Parks Foundation and op-eds and public talks is nature is essential. Like nature is open 24 seven. We need our green spaces to stay open um, because they're essential for our health. It's not just a, you know, something optional, it's we, we need this. So I think if, if anything, the pandemic has almost made our message resonate more, um, which is interesting. And then in terms of just overall barriers, like with the pandemic, obviously like 
schools shut down here in BC, you know, right around the time when I, I was, we were hoping to launch parks prescriptions initially. And so just having like my kid at home, homeschooling, trying to like run my clinic, everything else, like that obviously pushed our timeline back a bit. But, um, but yeah, I think the appetite for nature prescriptions is higher than it ever has been, I feel like in the past, which is, which is nice. I mean, we, I wish we didn't have to have the pandemic to make that happen, but, but right yeah. now it's, it's just a, a prime time for this kind of idea. Yeah, I second that. And the number is $83 million were put into our provincial parks here. And that, that's not including our national parks, but that's just in BC, the provincial parks. So it's really exciting. That's great. And Carl brought up a good point as well, is that quality parks are used. Um, if you don't have clean functioning restrooms, there's a big barrier. So no one's gonna use your parks. It's the basics that, that have to be hit for people to feel comfortable and safe to go out and enjoy it uh, for the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. One more question before I let you go. And, and this is not a fully formed question. So feel free to push back or play with it. Um, and, and this is particularly acute to my community of Louisville and Minneapolis where we went through enormous trauma this past year uh, with our, our calls for racial reconciliation and healing. Do you, have you play, have you explored anything in the role of green spaces in bringing healing to those moments of shared trauma um, as a community and any sort of restorative function or is that, that maybe next level resource? But we watched a, a lot of our community go through a, a world of hurt um, together. I mean, painful stuff I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. What, how is the role of these urban green spaces that maybe at night were the scene of some of this trauma, but then during the day, we asked them to switch gears and be part of the healing. Have y'all played around with that? Again, it's an incomplete question. It's probably more of a, a wandering thought, uh, but just interested to hear any feedback. You know, I don't know that we've explored that specifically, um, but I do know there is some research around what happened with green spaces in New York around 9-11 and why people, how people use those spaces and what they meant to them. Um, and I think the themes that consistently came out in that research was it's, it's a healing space. It feels like a safe space. Um, so I think like, like the U.S. has already kind of gone through that in a way um, around 9-11. So yeah, I mean, again, with some of the work that we do with the BC Parks Foundation, like we focused on taking refugee families out into green mm -hmm. spaces who have themselves gone through a lot of trauma um, and who, when they've come to Canada, um, because of socioeconomic reasons are kind of stuck in these high rises with yeah. eight people in, you know, in a two bedroom apartment. Like it's, yeah. So, so I don't know that we've explored in a very specific way, like dealing with trauma, but through practical ways, we've tried, we've tried to keep that in mind, but I, I would, I would, I know there's a study out there. I, I, re I read about it. I think when I wrote a piece about it, um, about 9-11 and how people use Central Park afterwards to heal. So mm -hmm. I do a Google search or something to find that piece. Yeah, I just want to add, I mean, that's a fascinating question. And I, I think there's so many places to go with it. But I, I, I think that the beauty of nature, too, is that it belongs to all of us. And then it does transcend culture and differences, because there's nature is in everyone's history. So I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but I just think it is a really powerful force for healing. And uh, I hope that there, there is some way that that can happen. Great. Well, we are just over our time limit now. I wanna thank both of y'all so much um, for taking time to share with this audience. I feel like we could go on for an hour and I hate to put you on the hook, but yeah, we're coming back to y'all. Um, a lot more <laughs> people need to listen and learn. Um, so thank you and thank all the attendees as well. Um, if you registered, you will get the email shortly, uh, which will be the encapsulation of this talk. And then I know everyone's going to be sucking up to you, Jenny, for that slide deck, uh, me included. Um, so however we can get that information out will be greatly appreciated as well. So thank you all. Thank Ben. Thank Maggie at Epley. And uh, we will see you guys again. Until then, be safe, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.